people, lazy and evil For years I've watched y'all allow Donald Trump turn you to crazy people Where's that freedom ego when you Welcome to Three Count Commentaries This is your host Mongo Slade So, we're going to be talking about uh, AEW Dynamite from April 27th, 2022 all right, so first news and notes, Hangman Page will not be here because Hangman Page has COVID. Uh, I don't think anybody would really notice that he wasn't there, considering he's almost never featured on the show anyway. I cannot remember a less featured world champion than Hangman Adam Page. And I mean anywhere. I mean anywhere. Pick a, pick a promotion anywhere at any point in time in history. I think you will find that your rinky dink wrestling fed between children in a backyard on a trampoline has a better concept of what a world champion is than AEW does when it comes to Hangman Page. So Hangman Page has COVID. Hopefully he's okay, but it's not like we're going to miss him anyway because he doesn't do shit. All right. Next thing Warner Brothers Discovery is looking to cut $3 billion. And, uh, they recently announced that TNT and TBS probably will not be getting any more scripted television, which is sort of the lifeblood of both of those networks. Now, what does this mean for AEW? It's unknown because we don't know whether AEW is considered live sports or scripted or unscripted television. Now, their deal with Warner Brothers, I think, ends next year, 2023. We should know by then what's going on. Uh, we probably should know fairly soon if they're trying to cut $3 billion um, off of uh, the various networks that they now have. So this is going to be one thing to keep track of. This was in deadline. There's actually a show that they've canceled a couple of shows, too. So they've really been uh, they're dead serious about this. Again, Discovery is a lifestyle brand and they just bought Warner Brothers. So lifestyle brand, you know, travel channel, food network, that kind of stuff. I'm not sure what even TNT or TBS will look like under the guidance of those ne of the you know people who want to be a, a lifestyle brand, let alone whether pro wrestling fits into that lifestyle brand. So I'm not ringing the bell saying that AEW is in any type of trouble yet. I'm just giving an update. And the update is Warner Brothers is starting to look to cut $3 billion from their various networks and all of their production. And they've already stated that they're going to, you know, get rid of uh, scripted television. So um, AEW better keep, uh, <laughs> better keep their eye on this thing. I'm talking very, very closely. All right. First match from Dynamite, because we always start with a match. CM Punk is on commentary for Cash Wheeler versus Dax Harwood. In the Owen Hart Tournament Qualifier. Um, so they, they tried to do some heat in this match. Where I think it was an accidental eye poke. And Dax was trying to take advantage of it. And Wheeler was like back off. And then they kind of started having a little bit of a shoving match. Uh, there was no punches or kicks thrown. At least I don't remember seeing any kicks. Unless it might have been a drop kick. Uh, so no strikes were really thrown. It was a lot of wrestling stuff. I did some high spots. Both of them were uh, Hart Foundation inspired trunks. OK, the finish came in with Dax teasing a sharpshooter. Uh, it got countered by a roll up by cash and then he countered the roll up. So Dax Harwood wins with a small package. Uh, the crowd was it got into it a little bit later in the match. Um, I don't think the crowd wants to see these guys fight each other, nor do I think anybody really wants to see these guys fight each other because for starters, there's no heat and we know that there's no heat. And they did an excessive amount of hugging and everything after the match. They were even hugging each other while they both were on the ground. Um, it was a fine match. You know, I'm not going to say the match was bad. Match was fine. Two very professional pro wrestlers, but they answered a question that we shouldn't even have asked. We never should have asked who would win in a fight between Cash Wheeler and Dax Hardwood. We never should have even asked that question. So I'm 100% against them even having this match. But since they did, they did it. You know, I don't see how, you know, <laughs> what I know that on Twitter, Cash Wheeler says, you know, if I win, uh, I beat the best wrestler in the world. If I lose, I lost to the best wrestler in the world or something like that. I'm like, come on, man, get out of here with this. 
All right, so CM Punk came out there to cut a promo after it was announced that CM Punk will be match will be fighting Hangman Page at Double or Nothing. It was just announced. Um, so it's just going to happen. Okay, cool. CM Punk says that he asked the question before he came back. Uh, can he do this? And that he now knows that yes, he can. And that everything up to this point, no disrespect to everybody except Eddie Kingston. Because he doesn't like Eddie King. So he said everybody up to this point has just been a warm-up. Now, he can't promise he's going to win this match, but he will promise that he will go 100%. Because even though this place is in Las Vegas, he's never been a betting man. But he will always bet on himself. So win, lose, or draw, see, uh, Adam Page will know he was in a fight when he gets in the ring with CM Punk. And CM Punk truly likes AEW. You know, he probably has a lot of fun there. But this, uh, I don't think this is a money drawing promo. We got, we still got some time, of course, to actually build to a money drawing promo. This, uh, I like, and it's it's kind of weird, but I kind of like the, the the small shreds of doubt that he put in this promo by saying that he can't promise he's going to win, that he's going to give it the old college try, going to give one hundred percent. You know, Adam Page is going to know he was on a fight. Because instead of just, you know, going in there and kind of dogging him out, kind of what Danielson did by, you know, treating him as if he wasn't on his level. Punk is saying, well, the guy's the world champion and, you know, he's pretty good. So there's the chance that I won't win. And I think he's also planting seeds in the doubt, seeds of doubts in the minds of people who say that he's just going to win this match. Um, so he's basically just saying, you know, hey, there's a chance that I could lose, guys. Remember, you know, 50-50 chance of winning. Unless you're Scott Steiner, then you got a 133% chance of, percent chance of winning. All right, so Dan Lambert uh, says that Scorpio Sky is not in this position by a fluke. And that, you know, there's a reason he's in this position. Oh, boy. Scorpio Sky then ran down his resume again, says that he got screwed, but he's not going to complain because this Philly crowd is not here to listen to him complain. The Philly crowd is here to see him kick Sammy Guevara's ass. All righty. Sammy Guevara had a bit of a, uh, a promo later where he says, congrats. He called Scorpio Sky a kid and says that he's been the most forgettable guy in AEW. That, oh, you were a former first tag team champion. Nobody remembers that. You are the TNT champion. I already forgot that. And then says that uh, something about Ty Conti being the most beautiful girl in all of AEW or something, some such. So this leads us to the main event, a ladder match for the TNT championship. Uh, Sammy Guevara versus Scorpio Sky. Uh, it was billed as Sammy's match. So this is basically Sammy Guevara picked this match because this is his specialty. And uh, they're one and one against each other with no definitive finish either way. So both of them kind of has cheap victories coming into this match. An actual storyline. Okay. Uh, they've swapped places in terms of when this thing started, Guevara was the heel. Guevara was, was the baby face, I'm sorry. And he got cheated um, in order to for Scorpio Sky to win the title. And then the reverse happened. <laughs> so this is the rubber match to blow off. Now, we're all set up in this match. And... We get to <clears throat> the spot. <clears throat> Excuse me. The spot. Sammy Guevara does a flippity doo dah off the top of, well, the mid part of the ladder. Missed and essentially power bombed himself onto the mat. He then laid there for two to three minutes, almost the entire length of a commercial break. He had to roll outside the ring to get back onto his feet. Because he was having trouble standing up. Uh, at some point, I kept asking the question, maybe we should stop the match. Of course, we're not going to do that, however. So the match continues. We just give him some time to recuperate. You know, I guess as you, you fell from the top of the ladder. It's okay. You just got your bell rung. That's all right. Continue the match, why don't you? So then they did the spot where Sammy jumped off the top of another ladder and caught a cutter. He seemed to be down uh, an inordinate amount of time for that, too. Then they break out a ladder covered in barbed wire. And then things went really went off the rails. As the girls start getting involved, 
Uh, at this point, Sammy Guevara pulls Dan Lambert into the ring. Uh, Ty Conti kicks Dan Lambert in the nuts. Paige Van Zant runs down there. She and Ty Conti start hockey fighting. So after they get done hockey fighting, the boys gets involved and it's, you know, the, the fight, the fight, 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 fight. Then they both start climbing the ladder with the women on their back and they go back to hockey. The women go back to hockey fighting after they fall off. Uh, Scorpio Sky is knocked off the ladder. Uh, he tilts the ladder over. Sammy Guevara falls from the top of that ladder onto the barbed wire ladder. Then he climbs up and pulls down the title to win it. So Scorpio Sky is now a two-time, two-time TNT champion. Sammy Guevara is a three-time TNT champion. Um, he's a he's one fifth of the way to Cody's magical fifteen-time <laughs> TNT champion. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. The thing about this is, is Tony Khan has said that, and this was really going to be in my news and notes, but I decided to save it for this. He says that, you know, the Ty Conti and Sammy Guevara thing is unprecedented because like everybody loved them when they were separate. And then when they come together, nobody likes them. You know, like we've never seen this before. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like there's an entire template of toxic couple like that. That whole template exists. Like you don't even got to go back that far. Like Seth Rollins and... Becky Lynch, what was that? What year was that? 2018? When everybody loved both of them when they were separate. The moment they got together, everybody was like, oh, this is trash. Get them off my TV. Was it 2020? or tw Not 2020, but 2019 or 2018. It was one of those two. It was during the man's man era. Ah, that was the worst era. I can't believe Seth Rollins did that to himself. He should have started going crazy after that. But that shows you that people are not really all that interested in seeing couples on TV. You know, there is something we like, yes, Sammy and Ty have that weirdo uh, proto cheating concept where, you know, pseudo cheating concept where people think that they were cheating on their spouses with one another and all that kind of stuff. You know, the, the gossip girl angle to it. But they're also just not likable people. Like, what did you like Sammy Guevara for? He likes to jump off stuff. It's like, do we really just like guys for jumping off stuff? It's like, you know, no, not Jeff Hardy. I, I, I heard you in, in your brain say, whoa, Jeff Hardy just jumped off stuff. Jeff Hardy was colorful. He was charismatic. He knew how to really get sympathy. It, he wasn't playing it up like, ho, 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 look at me. I'm just crazy old Jeff Hardy going to jump off stuff. That's Sammy Guevara. He's too, he's too self-aware about the whole, I'm about to do something crazy. Watch me do crazy stuff, guys. Jeff was just kind of like, all right, now is the time to jump off shit. The situation calls for me to jump off of this. I'm going to jump off of it. You know, just do it. Sammy Guevara has to be like, look at me, I'm all crazy. And the same thing with like Darby Allen, like, I'm I'm crazy. I'm gonna jump off this thing. It's like, mm, no, you gotta do a little bit more than that. Sammy Guevara has, you know, almost no charisma. And Ty Conti is a really good looking girl who, again, no charisma. So you have two charisma vacuums being kind of gross. And I guess that's what makes them work. Is the grossness of the relationship? I guess. You know, that would put them in Edge and Lita category. But at least Edge and Lita both, you know, individually had charisma. Individually, they had personality. Individually, people cared about them when they got together. And it was really, they were pushed together, you know, on screen because of what happened off screen. And that's kind of the same thing with Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti. The difference being is that people felt legitimate guttural hatred for Edge and, and Lita while just kind of nerds are like Sammy Guevara has a hot girlfriend and uh he should have just dated the girl who looks like a Mormon from Utah whatever so yes we have seen this before Tony Khan it's not like we're new to this we're true to this buddy so after the match uh Frankie Kazarian came down to the ringside to give his nod of approval to Scorpio Sky, and uh, we are reminded, as, as I forgot already, that Kazarian stepped aside so that Scorpio Sky could have this match. 
and thus will get a title shot um, as owed to him by Scorpio Sky. The one thing I will say about this in terms of Scorpio Sky winning, because I don't like Scorpio Sky. I just think that he's their favorite guy. He's their favorite black guy. Somehow bland chocolate. I don't know how you manage to be bland chocolate, but Scorpio Sky is that guy. All right. He is very bland. He's tasteless chocolate. You know, he's bland, boring guy in black. He is. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Because I'm not going to say he's Cory Booker. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but, you know, they're trying to make him the Barack Obama of AEW. He's not. He's boring. He's boring. He's a boring, 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 boring guy. He's boring. Uh, anyway, Scorpio Sky winning. Uh, it's a bad decision. But whatever. You know, he's a very good pro wrestler. Yes, yes. Mm. <sighs> yeah, sure. Um, I, I was going somewhere with this. I was going somewhere with this, and I, I forgot already because Scorpio Sky doesn't. Oh, yeah, that's where I was going with this. So when Sammy Guevara, uh, when he says that everybody's forgot Scorpio Sky's resume, I was like, I felt that because that is true. Nobody cares that he was one of the first tag team champions. Nobody cares that he was a TNT champion. He was TNT champion for like three weeks and lost in his second title defense. Um, I feel like they gave it back to him. Only because, you know, they saw the backlash of, <laughs> of of it. And the crowd had a pretty good reaction to him winning. But I think the crowd reaction to him winning was mostly because they just didn't like Sammy Guevara. So I think they'll go back to sleep once he starts doing this thing with Kazarian. You know? And watching old TNA pay-per-views, I always said to myself, like, man, Kazarian was always seemed like, you know, a guy who was right there. You know, like... uh he was always just right on the cusp. Like he was, I don't like not on the one yard line, but maybe on the 10 yard line of just a little bit of push, you know, the right character, the right persona, just a little bit of push. And he could have been a top guy in TNA. I don't think that way about AEW because he's over the hill. <laughs> I shouldn't say over the hill. I should just say past his prime, but that doesn't mean that he's not good. You know, um, from the looks of things, it might just be turning Kazarian heel because they completely dropped the ball with that whole elite hunter gimmick. I know I, I, I joke a lot about the elite hunter, but the thing about that is, is it has such promise. And then that promise was never fulfilled. In fact, it never even attempted. I don't even think he's had matches against most of those guys. I think he probably had one match against one young buck and lost or something like that. It was absolutely silly. It was absolutely silly, but I, I know. Let me move on. The Blackpool Combat Club defeated the Factory in a match that looks like every other Blackpool Combat Club match. Uh, Wheeler Utah won the match with a pinfall thing. I, I don't care, man. I have ranted and raved about Wheeler Utah all day. My God, he's just not good. I heard that uh, Moxley and Danielson are making him do promo drills, which is hilarious. <laughs> Which is hilarious. Um, I'm sure Moxley sitting in promo class didn't realize that he's going to be passing this knowledge that he's learned from all of the greats like Dusty and HBK. That he's going to now be sitting here talking to Wheeler Yuta and trying to get him to learn how to cut promos. You know. Uh, all right. Look, at least they're trying to help the kid. I'll give him some credit for trying to help him. But for uh, crickety Christ's sake, man. Can we do something other than these boring ass six man tags though? Like their opponents were Nick Camarado, QT Marshall, and some other guy. Like, come on, man, cut us some slack, please. Uh, so we got a backstage promo, a girls backstage promo. Uh oh, here's here's it to you, Becky Lynch, Jamie Hayter, <laughs> Britt Baker, and Tony Storm. So uh, Britt Baker, they all agreed once again. No contact backstage, no combat. Uh, they Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker didn't really have anything to say. But Tony Storm says that she's not going anywhere this time. And that uh, she's noticed a bit of a pattern between the two of them. And then she called in Ruby Soho. Because she got Ruby Soho there to watch her back. And Ruby says that, you know, every time somebody new comes into AEW, Britt Baker gets in their face and they decide to jump them. 
not this time, that she's going to have uh, <laughs> Tony Storm's back. How, 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 I just, I just can't. I'm trying not to laugh at the concept of Becky Lynch saying specifically she would like to see Ruby Soho win a title or something like that in that company. And then the very next day, they do an angle with Ruby Soho. Amazing. Amazing. That's great. So Britt Baker burns Ruby Soho by saying, you know what? We're not going to throw a punch. We're not going to fight you guys. In fact, we're going to get out of here. And we're going to go to your home sweet home, which is catering because I'm hungry. And she she burned Ruby Soho on her way out. Um, this was interesting. Uh, they're setting up a tag team match now. Apparently, we still don't know anything about the characters of these people. This is a longer promo for everybody involved. <laughs> well, for Tony and Ruby, it was, but we still haven't learned anything about the characters, their personalities, or their motivations. It's all about this silly tournament. And it's almost like the heat is completely phony. It's pseudo heat. There's no real heat between them. It's not, they they keep agreeing to have no contact as if they've been fighting a bunch before this. It's like, no, she had her match. She won. She had her match. She won. She had her match. She won. Now they're all in in the backstage segment and they're agreeing to no con, no combat. It's like, Can there have been some first? And then we're trying to get them to calm down. It's like, no, we're trying to get them to do what? I don't know. This seems to make no sense. But at least we got to give them credit. They had three women talking on AEW Dynamite. So should we stop and applaud? I don't have time. Uh, So Jungle Boy, he's he cut a promo too. Does this call it women's promo? Anyway, um, Jungle Boy says that he felt a little down because... uh, he know he could have won that match and he made some mistakes and you know, he doesn't want to sound like a sore loser, but he's going to get him next time. Christian said, no, you don't sound like a sore loser. You just sound like a loser. And the crowd immediately started booing. <laughs> immediately started booing. Then he said, but you're not a loser. And he said, you're a champion. Put that title up on your shoulder. And you know what? We're going to prove that you're not a loser. Any team in the top five, we will face you. At uh, whatever. Uh, Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs appears in order to get a tag team title match. And I said, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. We're doing something good here. Hobbs and Starks. Good. Thumbs up. I have nothing negative to say about this. Wait a minute. Did that guy just hiss? Did Luchasaurus just hiss or growl or roar or whatever what was that he just did whatever what happened to his ability to speak look i know that i don't think luchasaurus is the greatest promo of all time by any stretch of the imagination and him doing intelligent monster promos wasn't really a big fan of it but now he's devolved into the only thing he does is i'm like huh he's just gonna go (laughs) what (laughs) <laughs> uh, he uh he try he's trying to fuck this up for me uh look i'm okay with hobbs and starks you know perhaps being the tag team champions i like that i don't mind that i like that all right lance archer versus wardlow mjf starts the promo by saying women in philly use their personalities as birth control i would have said their faces or their bellies but hey it's philadelphia and then he says that uh, Lance Archer is going to silence every single person in this building. Uh, Warlow is introduced. He still has no theme song and he's been escorted by security. Lance Archer was already in the ring with his tramp stamp and his multicolored ponytail. Braided ponytail, by the way. I mean, we just got to we just got to make it right. Uh, he jumped off the ring apron onto the crowd of guys and Warlow. They actually did a really good job of getting Warlow over in this match. But even though they were doing big guy Lucha Libre, which I usually don't care for. And I say, usually I just shake my head at it. Considering Warlow was the smaller man in this match, him busting out of Hurricanrana, doing the doing the forward rolls out of the corner, you know, the Swanton bomb. I was kind of like, okay, he's a smaller man in this match. Now he's still 
maybe shouldn't be doing this stuff all the time. Maybe shouldn't didn't need to do all of it in one match. But it it was telling the story that he had, you know, the agility to counteract the size and strength advantage of Lance Archer. Then they started doing Lance Archer stuff where he's doing the Don Jardine walking on the top rope then and does the moonsault. And I'm like, all right, we just doing a get your shit in match at this point. All right, we're just trying to get our shit in. Uh, Lance Archer does his finish. Uh, Warlow not only kicks out of his finish, but counters it into a roll up and it almost pins him. Um, Warlow then lands one power bomb, lands two, lands three, lands four, pins him, wins the match, and the crowd is erupting. Best part of this thing was MJF and MJF. I'm not going to give that other guy any credit. He did a good job too, but I'm not going to say his name because if I ever have to give credit to that specific individual, I think I may just have to, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know what might happen. Like the universe might do something weird if I give that guy any credit, but he did a good job. They were up in the skybox selling Warlow's power bombs and everything, trying to get the crowd to shut up, you know, waving it off, telling Warlow not to do it. They did a good job up there. You know, then especially after the match when they were stunned that Warlow won, they were they did a really good job of really selling Warlow's victory. Give them credit, they really did a good job of Warlow here. I could criticize the big fella Lucha Libre, which I don't think help is helpful. I think that when he does stuff like that, you look at it and you say, Well, I'm significantly less interested in Jeff Hardy doing a swan time bomb when Warlow can do it and then do it better. You know, he do it. He does it better than Jeff now. I've seen so many people say that. Like, he does it better than Jeff now. And if you're Jeff, that's, that's your shit. If you're Jeff, that's your thing. You know, you're like, wait a minute. He's doing my thing better than me. I mean, imagine, you know, you're out there performing somebody's song better than they do. Then, you know, you can be like, wait a minute. Uh, They might not want to hear me sing my song anymore. They might just want to hear your version of the song. You know, but I'm going to cut him some slack. Big boy Lucha Libre. I'm going to cut him some slack on this and say they just did a good job with Warlow. Okay, it was very good. So uh, MJF later on made another phone call because he has infinite money. He has all the monies. He called and he asked his friend on the phone if he wanted to make six figures for one match. He got a clear yes. Then he says to the camera that Warlow's next opponent is taller than he is and stronger than he is, and you can't teach that. So clearly it's W. Morrissey, a.k.a. Big Cass, who has been working in Impact for the last several months. Um, bringing him in is a really good look for uh, AEW. He's going to come in and put a lot of guys to shame physically, because physically, the motherfucker is a marvel. All right. He is huge, jacked to the gills. Ja I mean, I'm talking edge on stilts on roids. Big dude, jacked the fuck up. You know, and he can cut a promo too. Like, he's not the most charismatic guy in the world, but he can cut a promo. Um, bringing him in as a hitter for MJF, I like that. Um, I would like for him to have a more significant role maybe later, but this seems like it's going to be a one night affair. So I'm cool with this. I'm, I'm cool with it. I don't have a problem with that. So all the Wardlow stuff tonight, still pretty good. I wish they didn't do the big boy Lucha Libre, but it's okay. It's okay. MJF being very cool and calm and collected after uh, Wardlow won was a little bit out of character, but considering that he's always got infinite money and he's always got all of these opponents and the labors that you have to go through to fight MJF. Yes, the storyline is repetitive. Yes, it's silly. No, we shouldn't still be doing this, but it's a way of prolonging the storyline. And as long as they keep doing things that prolong the storyline, I will give it a pass. Um, at some point, though, we have to attack Warlow from a different angle because we're looking at it from we're trying to overpower him. By picking guys who are bigger and stronger than he is. Like Lance Archer is like the big bruiser. And now this guy's a big bruiser. It's like, okay, they're both going to, Warlow's going to beat both of them. At some point, we need to get somebody who's like a sharpshooter. 
somebody who's more uh, psychological, somebody who's going to target an elbow or a knee or something like that and take it out and create a weakness for uh, MJF to exploit. And maybe that's maybe that guy's going to be the other guy. I hope not, because I, I fucking hate that guy. I really do. I can't stand the guy. Can't stand the man. Cannot stand the man. I'm not going to say his name. going to Voldemort his ass. He, he does not exist in the Three Count Commentaries galaxy. There was a vignette for Trent Beretta versus Samoa Joe for the ROH TV title. I can't muster up the energy to care about this. Uh, a lot of stuff was announced for Rampage. I saw Keith Lee is going to be wrestling Colton Gunn. Ah, huh? Okay. Uh, they they announced Shane Strickland. I'm sorry, Swerve Strickland. God damn, he's going to be wrestling Darby Allen in a uh, Owen Hart tournament thing. So that's going to be on Rampage. I'm not sure. Is that this week? Yes, it's going to be on this week. I guess. Uh, so they had a face to face promo, in which Swerve Strickland went through the whole. He's proud of Darby. They wrestled a hundred times up in Seattle at Defy Wrestling. Um, Defy Wrestling, by the way. Uh, some of the best camera work I've ever seen in a pro wrestling promotion. Legit. Like, uh, I've seen some Defy Wrestling. I love the aesthetic. I love the way that they use the cameras. I love the arenas that they use. It's kind of smoky. It's almost cinematic in a way. Like, I love the way Defy Wrestling looks. It just looks tremendous. And I, I don't have time to follow another wrestling promotion, but I have seen some defy wrestling from the, the camera work and stuff that they do is pretty good. So that's where they know each other for all of the people who are like, where do they know each other from? It's like, they, they mentioned it here that they have history from the Seattle wrestling scene. And, uh, Darby said, you can't just go into everybody. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I got to do my Darby Allen voice. You can't just go to every wrestling company and say, it's your house. AEW is not your house. AEW is my house. I've been here since day one. And on Rampage, I'm going to show you why this is my house. And I'm going to show you why the Owen Hart tournament is my tournament. You always got to talk like you're half dead when you're Darby Allen. Because Darby Allen's half dead. That's his gimmick. I'm half dead. So he has to talk. Like he's half dead or half pilled out of his mind. Uh, another thing that they announced is Deanna Perrazzo versus Mercedes Martinez will actually take place next week for uh, the undisputed Ring of Honor Women's Championship. They're really blowing this Ring of Honor stuff out of the water. They're using all the Ring of Honor stuff. <laughs> They're using all of it. All of it. Uh, so Deanna Peraza will finally make her appearance on uh, AEW Dynamite. They must have made another phone call to Impact and says, hey, can we use some talent, please? Uh, I fully expect Deanna Peraza to win that match, but I wouldn't be surprised if Mercedes Martinez won. Uh, something tells me they're likely to put the belt on Deanna and make her the undisputed champion. But we'll see. I'm, that match actually has some intrigue to it, so. That's cool. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it at that. There's some other stuff announced too, but none of it really jumps out at me. Oh yeah, Hook versus Danhausen. Um, it's a gimmick match, as far as I'm concerned. It, nobody knows anything about Danhausen in terms of being a wrestler, so why would you be excited about it? I mean, unless you watched Ring of Honor or watched the Independence, you don't know shit about Danhausen as a wrestler. You don't know if he's a threat to Hook, but they haven't portrayed him as a threat to Hook. He's been a comedy fodder let's put it like that so they continue to just basically treat hook with as which with kid gloves which is you know studying his growth because he, the kids should be doing a lot better right now but you know they're quote-unquote taking their time in other words to just being scared the same thing with jay cargill they think that you know leaving people to be undefeated and not talking and all that kind of stuff is creating mystique and all that shit it's like really you're just kind of not striking while the iron is hot you know not saying that you should have thrown hook in the main event the moment he really got over but after a couple of squash matches you know we should have been him trying to get in somebody's face for that tnt title or something like that and then other people kept distracting him 
You know, instead of just him seeming wandering aimlessly through rampage, wrestling, job guys, winning, and people just kind of being like, oh, okay, I guess. Make a statement, make an impact with the fucking kid, you know? All right, so let's get back into the show. No more announcements. Um, the Jericho Appreciation Society, so the, the AEW Galaxy, was promised that there will be no physicality in this segment and that it was guaranteed by all parties. But that, this was by the non fat guy of, of 2.0, the AEW Galaxy. Boy, they're going all the way in. There, there's couches in the ring and tables in the ring. Of course, typical WWE stuff. There's couches in the ring, tables in the ring. Jericho wants an apology for uh, Pittsburgh, where he was <laughs> denied entry, and therefore the people of Pittsburgh were denied the gift of Jericho. Um, <laughs> drink it in, man. I love that era of Jericho. That was so funny. Uh, of course, Santana Ortiz both end up flipping him off. Uh, Jericho looks like he hasn't slept in weeks. And um, I don't know what's up with his hair, but it looks very stringy. He looks like a heroin addict. At least he's not fat. So, you know, I mean, the fact that he doesn't like he goes to sleep anymore, at least he's not fat. So, okay, we're going to. So Santana started a serious promo by saying, you know, the problem is that Jericho turned his back on two du- on the two dudes he knew best. And as Santana was trying to lay down a serious groundwork, Sent, uh, Daniel Garcia interrupted them to talk about Eddie Kingston's well-manicured eyebrows and taunt them and say, that, what are you going to do, hit us? What are you going to do, hit us? Uh, not good. Uh, Eddie Kingston hates sports entertainment, wants to fight, doesn't want any of this sports entertainment crap. They threw the tables and threw the, the chairs and the couches all over the place. They don't care if it's five on three. They want to fight. Jericho says that he, you know, you're, you guys are stupid. It is five on three. And I'm going to put a hit out on all of you bitches. He didn't say bitches, but he said, I'm putting a hit out on all of you bitches. He didn't say that either. He said, I'm going to put a hit out on all you three guys. You three fellas. You three gentlemen. Eddie Kingston got real, real mad and said, when you say you put a hit on somebody, you don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. You know what that means in my world? It means you're ready to end things. Put, a, put, the, put, the, put the finger guns to Jericho's head. That's what it means when you say you're going to put a hit on somebody in my world. It means you're going to end things. Jericho says, what are you going to do? You're going to hit me? AEW is your last chance. Nobody wants you. Nobody wants you. You're going to get fired from another place. Nobody wants you. Eddie Kingston got real mad about this hit. He was real upset about the concept of a hit being on him. (laughs) Uh, Back Jericho down into the corner. Jericho was all with the gangster lean, scared. And uh, the segment thankfully ends <laughs> with Jericho being all, being all, ooh. <laughs> Later, the Jericho Appreciation Society jumped uh, Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz in the back, beat him down, and threw a fireball in the face of Eddie Kingston, ruining, no doubt, those well manicured eyebrows. Those eyebrows, they just jobbed out. The, the the epicness of Eddie Kingston's eyebrows just got jobbed out. So, uh, fireball spot, uh, okay. Uh, the immediate retaliation by Jericho Appreciation Society, okay, very heelish. Um, I'm guessing two other guys are going to join Eddie Kingston's team eventually. I wonder who those two guys might be. But they're not going to let it be five on three forever. Now, it probably could. You could certainly get away with it. And it'd be better for the baby faces to be outnumbered because then they have a, a uphill battle to fight. <clears throat> but um, I didn't mind the segment. I thought the segment was pretty good. Um, they're doing a great clash of pro wrestling and sports entertainment where Jericho is really going over the top, um, utilizing all the WWE tropes. And all this kind of stuff. And Kingston just basically getting over by just saying how much he hates it. Which is what he would say anyway. I hate this. I hate this. I hate all the sports entertainment stuff. I don't like all the sports entertainment stuff. And Jericho doing sports entertainment stuff. So it was fine as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Did we really need the fireball? Probably not. But 
it was a way to escalate the beef. So that's fine. And maybe if Kingston is gone away for a while to sell the fireball, then maybe we can get something out of this. Now, it was a good way of, you know, stretching this thing out. Now, I don't know what they're going to do at the pay-per-view because they're apparently not going Kingston Jericho again. They may do the five on three, maybe a 10 man stadium stampede thing. Ain't that any time for one of those? Or is that another pay per view that they do? I don't know. But, uh, I don't like Jericho's crew. I still don't like them. They're, they're all just trash. They're all just trash individuals. And I uh, just not feeling it. Not feeling Daniel Garcia with the Kangol hat. Um, I guess that's supposed to be a nod at Triple H when he wearing the Kangol because Triple H wore a Kangol hat in the 90s. Um, I don't understand what it added to either one of those characters. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like uh, like LL Cool J wore a Kangol, but it was a different kind of Kangol, and it was in the 80s. So I'm not sure what's going on here, man. And uh, they're trying very hard with Daniel Garcia in 2.0, but I'm just not feeling it, man. These guys just don't appeal to me. You know, they don't appeal to me as a as the future of AEW or future stars. It just feels like Jericho having to carry four other fucking guys. You know, it's like, it, it's great for Jericho because he continues to be the star. He doesn't have to worry about being upstaged, you know, but in this situation, it's, it's rough because the only person that can really cut great promos is Jericho on his side, you know, on the other side, Santana is really good at promos and Kingston's really good at promos. And it's hard to really get into what they're doing because the only person who could talk on the other side is Jericho. The other fucking guys, they might have some charisma in, in the way they um, pronounce things can be funny. Like the fat guy from 2.0, he has good charisma in terms of his ability to to cut a promo and to talk. But he's, un, he's just uninteresting. I don't even know what his fucking name is. I don't remember what his name is. You know, I can't remember the names of any one of these guys, you know. But at least they have characters. So maybe they're doing something right. They got characters. Um, back to the show. Fourth match on the show, Philly Street Fight, Hikaru Shida versus Serena Deeb. This match did not have any blood, and I was surprised that they didn't go full blood bath on this match after they were criticized. In fact, it felt like a normal match with chairs and stuff. You know, Hikaru Shida had Old Faithful, her kendo stick. Serena Deeb did her usual tricks, you know, a target and a body part. She jammed Hikaru Nida's knee into the chair multiple times, beat her with the Texas Cloverleaf or was it a single leg crab? I think it was a Texas Cloverleaf. Hikaru Shida submits and Thunder Rosa was watching the whole time. So that's where we're going with Deeb, Deeb versus Thunder Rosa. Ought to be a great match in terms of in-ring stuff, but character work is what matters. And neither one of them has any, Deeb has a character. She just doesn't have any charisma or any crossover appeal. Thunder Rosa doesn't even have, really have a character other than I'm Mexican. And that's kind of it. Like I'm Mexican, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of what you would call it in, in Spanish, but never mind. She's like, uh, fuck day of the dead. You know, that's kind of her gimmick. But it's just it's just face paint. It equals nothing in terms of her actual character. You know what <laughs> doesn't mean anything. All right. Speaking of just you know darkness for no reason, the House of Black is still feuding with Fuego del Sol. Fuck, Fuego del Sol is laid out you know like a sacrifice on the ramp, and nobody really gives them any reaction for this. Nobody cares about Fuego del Sol. I don't know, this is the first time I've seen that fool in months. Uh, they were going to take off Fuego del Sol's mask. There's a guy in the ring, and there's a voice saying that it's Alex Abrahentes saying that, didn't we tell you if you keep messing with Fuego del Sol, we were going to come out and get you? And then, you know, House of Black just start marching to the ring because they're like, okay, Alex Abrahentes has just turned this fucking guy inside out and we'll be done with here. So they get in the ring and they find out that, oh, it's not Alex Abrahentes. Uh, Penta Oscuro comes out the babyface ramp. Pac comes out the babyface ramp. And then 
Alex Abrahente comes out of the babyface ramp, and everybody's like, oh? And then, of course, after Pac came out, I pretty much figured, Phoenix is back! Phoenix takes off the robe. He bumps all the members of House of Black. So, now... Death Triangle is back in full force. It's very good to see Phoenix return. Uh, I, I like the concept of House of Black versus the Death Triangle. That's fine. I just don't understand why we did this whole thing with Fuego del Sol. I understand we need to do something for Phoenix to come back. And, you know, maybe that was the plan is to have this as a stopgap of some kind until Phoenix was able to come back. But it just seemed like a waste of Malachi Black's time, especially since we, you know, had all these promos and stuff uh, aimed at Fuego, and now we're not going to get a match with Fuego. We're going to have a Death Triangle match. So it's like, okay, we're going to move this guy out the fucking way, which I have a problem with. You know, he's a dust mite. Get him out of the way. But why build to a match that we're not going to get? Sure, we're going to get a better match, but why build and waste time for a match that we're not going to get? Uh, start the clock on Phoenix's next injury because I can almost guarantee you it's coming. He's just like Sammy Guevara. It's coming. You know, um, he immediately started doing jumpity jump shit too right after this. He's a luchador. I mean, it's in his, it's in his blood. He's got to jump. You know, there's a jumping bean joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going to take that opportunity. Um, but Phoenix is back. That's very good. Um, Death Triangle versus House of Black. Okay, I like it. Uh... So, a big fat yawn on the 10-man tag, Adam Cole, Red Dragon, and the Young Bucks versus the Varsity Blondes, Brock Anderson, Dante Martin, and Lee Johnson. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yikes. Uh, they're still doing the Julia Hart one-eyed sullen thing where she's sitting on the steps. Look, you would think at some point we would have furthered this storyline. If nothing else, if these guys are supposed to be like her brothers or something like that, wouldn't they at some point pull her to the side or in front of a camera and say, Julia, what's going on? You've been wearing this eye patch for like, uh, four months. You've been sitting on the steps lost in, in lost in space for four fucking months. What's, what's going on here? What's the problem? You know, what, what you got going on here? What's under there? You know, maybe she's like Kano from Mortal Kombat. She's gonna, she's gonna peel it off and she's gonna have like a laser eye. You know, like a cyborg guy or some shit like that in there. What's going on? You know, can we further this story along? along? You know, you're not, you're not, you know, <laughs> you're not furthering the story just by telling, reminding me that it's there. All right. You have to actually further the story. There has to be things that occur that move the story forward. It need to be conversations. It needs to be, you know, her snapping off on people, you know, her having a bad attitude or something like that. They've probably been doing that stuff on Dark, but if it doesn't happen on Dynamite or Rampage, I don't care. Maybe on Dark they're doing a bunch of stuff, but I don't fucking know about it because I don't watch Dark. So, and I'm not going to blame myself for not watching every single goddamn thing they do. WWE would not further a storyline on main event, you know? And if they did, they would recap it on Raw or SmackDown. Like, come on, respect your audience's time, B. You know, so after the match, Adam Cole gives the Young Bucks undisputed elite shirts because they didn't have any. And they also came out to separate theme songs. You know, the Young Bucks are trying to, they're trying to do them. And Adam Cole is trying to make them members of the undisputed elite so he can be the leader, no doubt. This of all, it was, I guess we're getting close to the return of Kenny Omega. And then AEW will be at full strength. They'll have everybody. Um, so, well, just about everybody. So, uh, okay, I, I didn't. I didn't need this. I, we could have put this on Rampage or put this on Dark. This is the kind of shit you would do on Dark because it furthered literally only one storyline. That is the inter intra elite gossip girl being the elite crap. And I don't, nobody cares about this. You know, I don't care who's friends and who's not friends and how much of friends they are with other people and all that shit. I don't care, man. Uh, I don't think any adult person cares that much about bullet club politics and, you know, who's the true elite and all that shit. You know, you, you're trying very hard to get people to care about this. Trying very, very hard. 
Adam Cole, once he lost to Hangman Page, I I was done with it, to be quite honest. This is not a good secondary story and not a good backup story. Even if he was to wrestle Kenny Omega, I have no faith that he'd win because he coming off losses to Hangman Page. You know, he's not like he just won a big feud or anything like that. So I don't know. Anyway, that's the show. That's the entirety of the show. Um, I guess you could say it was solid. Um, I gave them a, I gave them credit for Wardlow. I think that was pretty good. The main event was atrocious because of all the shit with the women. And then Sammy Guevara down there killing himself. Uh, it was time. I wish I could. T- I wish I could get back. Uh, the ten man tag was a waste of time. The Blackpool Combat Club thing was a waste of time. Uh, the FTR match was fine, but I didn't need it. Uh, Sheeta and Deeb even kind of under delivered. I thought they were trying to go overboard with the whole Becky Lynch thing dangling over their head, but they decided to just do what they do, which is smart. They tried, they, they no sold it. So that was smart. Um, but I, I, I didn't hate the show. But I just feel like it was nothing special. You know, like it was nothing really. It's just another episode of Dynamite where the best thing about it was Phoenix's return. And then I wasn't, I, I was tempered immediately because I'm like, Fuego Do Soul is somehow involved with this. So to t- discuss, you know, Hangman Page versus CM Punk, uh, it's not exactly Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns. You know, they look like two Uber drivers fighting at a red light. You know, it just feel like two guys that just get into a fight somewhere. I'm just kind of looking like, all right, that's your world title match. I'm not, I don't hate it because I don't hate Adam Page. I know it sounds like I might. I just don't care about him. You know, I don't care about his story. I don't, I don't care about his cowboy stuff. You know, I don't care about any of that shit. And CM Punk, you know, he's he's not the CM Punk that we all uh, knew who he was in, you know, 2011 and years before that. You know, 20, 2011, 2012, 2013. He just don't have that spark anymore, you know. He, he, ha- he would have to win in order to save this company, though. He is the, what AEW, it's their last chance to really get over. CM Punk needs to win in order to really get over AEW. He needs to go on a run where he wrestles all of the guys that people want to see him wrestle. You know, Danielson, Moxley, Omega, Cole. He needs to have the belt in order to do that. You know, MJF, uh, you know, double back to MJF. You know, if CM Punk loses, I think a lot of people will lose faith in AEW. Sure, there's going to be some people who are going to say, well, but MJF is probably going to be the guy who's going to beat Hangman Page. It's like, you probably need to get that belt on a name. Even if it's temporary, you probably need to get a belt, get that belt on a name. CM Punk doesn't need the belt, but AEW needs for him to have it. It's that simple. Does CM Punk need the belt? No. Do AEW need CM Punk to have the belt? Yes. Yes. Yes, <laughs> they need it. They need it like yesterday. Because everything CM Punk has touched, with the exception of MJF, has been devalued since he touched it. And it's not entirely his fault. Not entirely his fault. But he derailed Darby Allen something major. I mean, Darby Allen was TNT champion, main events, all kinds of shit. He lost to CM Punk and it's just been whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like driving... With on bold tires over an ice sleet for Darby Allen. He's just been all over the place. You know? <laughs> Hobbs had a tough time. He finally found his footing again. He had a tough time. A lot of the guys CM Punk beat is, you know, they're not better off afterwards. You know? So Hangman Page losing, it's like he's not in the best position right now anyway. But, you know, so it's not that big of a deal. But, you know, to have him lose to Hangman, ooh. I think some people would just be like, look, that's horse shit, and I don't care. So I'm saying, like, they need to put the title on on Punk. 
I could be wrong. People could say, oh, you're wrong, Mongo. I'll say, okay, well, go for it. Put the title, um, keep the title on Hangman. You know, the most irrelevant world champion in history. It is what it is, though. You know, but let me know what you guys think. Um, is there anything that I missed? Because I feel like I missed something. I feel like something's missing. But let me know what you guys think. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out. Mongo Slate. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>